Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the Sky and Telescope. This will be an author series. And I'm very happy to have Ted Forte with us today. Hey, Ted. Hey, Frank. How are you doing? I am doing quite well on this Arizona. Uh, and I believe you're in Arizona as well. Um, I am. Cool. What parts of Arizona are you at? So I'm in southeastern Arizona in Cochise County. Oh, okay. So I'm about... Uh, eight miles east of Sierra Vista, mm. Arizona. So that's a town of about 45,000 people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm in- So uh, we're just, uh, just along the Mexican border, a few miles from, from Mexico. Yep. yep. And uh, cloudy skies this morning. Oh, uh, yeah. I got some high clouds outside my window today. Um, so it must be like that all over. That is a pretty awesome image of an observatory behind you. What is that? That is, that is the Patterson Observatory, and it's located here in Sierra Vista on the campus of the University of Arizona, Sierra Vista. Cool. So Arizona, the uh, UA has a, a College of Applied Science and Technology here in Sierra Vista, and there's a private foundation that uh, supports the university. And that private foundation, the University South Foundation, owns that observatory behind me. Wow. And members of my astronomy club, the Huachuca Astronomy Club, operate that observatory. We're the volunteer operators. Very and nice. I'm sort of the director of operations at that observatory. So there's a 20 inch uh, RC okay. under that 16 foot dome. Yeah, I was going to ask. Okay. What goodies do you have under yeah. the dome? <laughs> right. Now, that's usually where we do most of our outreach in town. But uh, because of the COVID, we're, we're kind of shut down. So we're actually doing a research project at Patterson. So there's a local um, pro-am astronomer, uh, one of our club members. Uh -huh. He's uh, part of a consortium, you know, that's comprised of a couple of amateurs around the country and uh, uh, several professional astronomers. And they're right now we're doing every night with the the scope is dedicated to uh, doing taking photometry on a uh, test discovery. It's a, a triple star candidate in links. Yeah, you don't have to spill your research project. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> but, but no, because that could be enough. Um, oh, that's very cool. Very cool. Yeah. It's, so it's some good We're excited stuff. about it. And it's, uh, we're very happy that the scope that doesn't usually get all much, that much use has been you know, performing really well. It's mm -hmm. uh, been mm -hmm. a real plus for us. Well, well, I hope you get some clear skies here. Maybe it'll clear up for tonight and you can go. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Uh, so, Ted, how long have you had the astronomy bug, and what do you generally, when you're not looking at test uh, follow-up candidates, what do you like to do in astronomy? So, I'm probably unusual for a lot of uh, amateur astronomers because I got a really late start. Mm -hmm. I uh, I was an armchair astronomer, you know, early on, but I didn't get my first telescope until I was 35. Okay. And that was a, a present from my wife for one Christmas. It was just a little department store refract. Very nice. And that kind of got it kicked off. But, uh, you know, I was in the military at the time, and it, it took a while for me to get uh, get the time and the, and, the, and the background to be able to get out and observe. So it, it was a few more years before I got a serious telescope and, and actually started doing things. Cool. So, what was your first scope? What was your first scope you got? Well, my first serious scope was a yep. uh, Celestron 8-inch okay. SET. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, uh, and I almost immediately got aperture fever, but it took me a while to, to, to move up. <laughs> so, uh, after about a decade with that scope, I moved up to an 18-inch, okay. uh, an 18-inch obsession. And then after I retired and moved to Arizona, that was in 2012, uh, the house I bought came with a backyard observatory Whoa. and a 30-inch F4.45 star splitter to Dobsonia. So that's my primary telescope. Now. My backyard is photo class four. And uh, I've got a 30 foot by 30 foot row off roof with a 30-inch computer driven telescope. So I'm in uh, that is hog heaven if you can use yeah. it. <laughs> A, that is that is an awesome setup, and B, that's a serious setup. Yeah. So very cool. 
Uh, do you primarily look, like to look at like solar system objects or are you, are you an extra galactic type? Do you do any astrophotography? I, I don't do any astrophotography at all. I'm a 100% visual mm -hmm. and deep sky is my primary uh, interest. So it, it varies what I, what I like to look at. Of course, planetary nebula was my first love huh. and is still you know, one of the things I uh, use a lot at the telescope. But uh, recently, my goal has been to uh, try to observe all the NGC that I can see from my backyard yep. with that 30 inch. Mm -hmm. So uh, pretty close to about 6,800 objects, I think, that are available and I've checked off most of them. Wow. So we're working my way through that. Uh, I became interested a couple of years ago in um, the Herschel objects. Mm. So um, I did my own Herschel list and my own Herschel project and logged uh, 2,517, I guess, objects that uh, may be attributed to uh, Sororium. Now that was a lot of fun. I, uh, I really enjoy doing the visual stuff and stuff that was discovered visually, yeah. kind of retracing the steps of the, uh, you know, the you know, 19th and 18th century observers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's almost like communing with them when you're out there, you know, retracing their steps and starting to say, you know, what was it you saw and why'd you miss this and that sort of thing. And it's, it's quite fun. Things planetary nebula for goodness sakes. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Well, you know, I mentioned that that eight inch SCT, um, almost as soon as I got that scope, I uh, accidentally discovered the Dumbbell Nebula. I was just sort of scanning around in the, in the summer triangle and came across this thing and said, wow, what's that? And uh, that might be my stepping off point for what just made me interested in observing planetary nebula. And cool. so um, it's, it's been a kind of a lifelong effort or half a lifetime effort in, in observing these objects. Cool. And that is going to take us then to this really lovely article of Ted's first love and first discovery. So let's get to the March 2021 issue of Sky and Telescope. And we have springtime blossoms. And Ted, take us away. So first, I'd like to say that uh, the title, Springtime Blossoms, isn't mine. It came from Diana. <laughs> but I love it. I, I think it's great. She, uh, she's, she's good at doing that. And um, so that was a, a big contribution <laughs> for that article. The purpose of the article, of course, was to uh, try and uh, suggest a few objects that were visible on a, on a March evening. And... Um, I like to try and avoid article or objects that I've mentioned before. Okay. This is actually my sixth article on planetary nebulae for, for Sky and Telescope. It's my 22nd article overall. But so we, we tried to uh, touch on some of the, you know, better known objects that are easily uh, approached by someone with a smaller telescope, a six or eight inch telescope can reach couple of these objects. And then um, uh, it, it, signed up, caught, it kind of uh, evolves into uh, more challenging objects. Now, the last few are uh, really out there and you have, to, you have to try really hard at it. So looking at the article, you'll see the uh, first object there is uh, probably the best known object or one of the best known objects on the list is uh, the ghost of Jupiter down in um, Hydra. So NGC 3242 is, um, is, is a pretty well-known object. And a lot of people can see this with a, with a smaller telescope. It mm -hmm. looks like a small, uh, bright disc. But in large telescopes, uh, this thing really comes alive. I mean, the inside of this object is very intricate. And the more aperture you put on it, the more you're gonna see. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just fascinated by the intricate inner structure of this object. It has looping filamentary structure in it that you can see, yeah, especially in a larger aperture telescope. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, there's a, as typical of many of these planetaries, it's um, got an extended outer halo. So, um, you know, a really faint thing to look at. Planetaries are, are so varied in their morphology. I mean, that's what makes them so interesting. I mean, on one, one hand, they, they, they might be, you know, manifest just as a stellar-like point, you know, so they're just uh, very, very tiny. And the only way you're going to be able to tell them from a star is to know exactly what object you're looking at and to employ a filter to, uh, you know, to kind of pick out its spectrum a little bit so that you can distinguish it from an ordinary star. But on the other end of the spectrum, you have these humongous objects that are so large and so spread out that their, their surface brightness is incredibly low and they're very difficult to detect. So, and in between, you have a lot of these objects like, like the ghost of Jupiter. And in a small telescope, it does kind of look a little bit like Jupiter. And that's how it got its nickname. Yep. Kind of uh, looking like, uh, well, a pale ghost of, of Jupiter. It's a very planet size. In fact, uh, you probably know that we call these objects planetary nebulae because of their similarity to planets in a telescope. So William Herschel was credited with uh, the first use of the term. He, he labeled a couple of objects as planetary. And what he meant by that is that they held magnification like a planet and they kind of had that planetary look to them. You know, they looked like a planet. Of course, he wasn't uh, confused. I mean, they, he never thought that uh, these objects were planets, but um, that's where the term came from initially. Uh -huh. It may be an unfortunate term because, you know, we use the term planetary nebula also to describe the, you know, solar nebulas that, that create the planets. Yes. Yes. Now, I included well, the, uh, be the first time in astronomy that uh, funny definitions at times. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it does get confusing sometimes for, for especially for newbies. When they think about, uh, you know, the term planetary nebula, and they, they, they wonder what the connection is to planets, and there's very little, actually. So the, the next object is the uh, eight-burst nebula. It's 3132 is, um, you know, we, we kind of uh, went, went round and round about including this object because it is kind of a low declination, so many of our readers uh, it's, it's going to be a stretch for him to reach it, but it's such an interesting object that uh, I thought it was uh, appropriate to put into the, uh, into the mix. So it has a very bright central star. We listed in our, in our chart as a 10th magnitude central star, but it's actually a double. And the, um, the fainter of the two stars is a, it's about a 16th magnitude uh, secondary. Yeah. And that is the object that is probably responsible for ionizing that cloud. Okay. So, so it might be uh, worth noting that a, that a planetary nebula is uh, sort of an intermediate, intermediate stage of evolution of a sun-sized star. So stars that are, say, smaller than about eight solar masses. Bigger than that, they tend to explode as supernova. Mm -hmm. But eight solar masses and below, they kind of puff off their atmospheres in a gentler, uh, longer range explosion, if you will. There you go. It takes uh, thousands of years. Slow mo. And what has to happen is that the, um, the circumstellar nebula, that circumstellar cloud of material, has to reach an appropriate density at about the same time that the inner. Right, more, you know, the uh, progenitor star, or the, the core of the star, mm -hmm. has become exposed to the point that it is, it's radiating at the uh, right wavelengths to ionize or photoionize that cloud. Uh -huh. So that's why we see these glowing nebulae. And they last uh, eight to 10, sometimes 12,000 years where they're visible. To us. Yes. Yes. This is a pretty remarkable object, but it's, again, it's, it's so, it's, it has a rather low declination. So for a lot of us, including myself, it never gets very high in my sky. 
And so I've never really had a great look at it, but it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting object nonetheless. So these are, uh, these are transients, right? They don't last very long. Uh, so we're sort of in a uh, special time to be able to see them uh, relative to their lifetimes. Uh, exactly. We should, we should feel very, very privileged yeah. to have so many of them that are uh, in such a, such a state that we can see them and see them quite well. And it seems almost, or, uh, you know, uh, important that they radiate in the very wavelengths that we are best equipped to see. No, that's right. True. So their their primary uh, or their principal radiation is, is in the middle of the visible spectrum. So mm -hmm. essentially green light. And, um, you know, our eyes are exactly adapted to, to see those very wavelengths. So these things are, they're, they're like made for us to, to view. So what gives, uh, what gives this object its name? Why is it called eight burst as opposed to four burst or 24 burst? <laughs> well, uh, these are a, a series of outbursts that are apparent in the, in the spectrum of the object. And it got its uh, name from the, from, from the original paper uh, about the object um, from the uh, discoverers. Okay. And, um, well, I'm sorry, not the discoverers, but the, uh, the people that wrote a, um, a paper, a scientific paper on the object that mm -hmm. indicated that there were structures in there that, that showed that the object underwent a number of these outbursts, uh -huh. at least eight of them. And that's where it got the, the nickname of eight bursts. Very cool, very cool. Well, so I'll bet everyone out here probably knows our next object because it's on Charles Messier's list. Wow. You know, the Messier list only has four planetary nebulae on it. And uh, one of them is the Owl Nebula or M97. Mm. It's up there just off the bowl of the Big Dipper. Uh, pretty easy to find and it's uh, available most of the year to most of us. No, no. And um, as you can see in that photo, it has two very, uh, prominent dark features in it Boink. that look like eyes. And that's where it got its name as the Owl Nebula. Indeed. Those dark features may be uh, bubbles. It may have something to do with a binary interaction within the, within the, within the object. Mm -hmm. um, it may be um, sort of asymmetric uh, outbursts from the central star or any number of other things. And as I pointed out in the article, they, those dark eyes may not be all that, of, that visible in a small telescope, but the larger apertures, uh, say, you know, 10 and 12 inches and above, uh, that they're quite apparent. Mm -hmm. And if you pop a, a nebula filter into it, um, you'll see even more structure and those eyes become uh, a little more pronounced as the uh, as the filter brings out the, uh, the nebula itself. So it's, it's a very famous object, very well known and uh, easy to find off of the bowl of the Big Dipper. And if you find M108, which is a uh, nice galaxy uh, just right next door to it. In fact, usually when I'm looking for the, uh, for the owl, that's usually what I come across first. I find M108 and then I know where to go. If, if, find the net, you know, find the owl. Yes. Pretty, uh, at least at this scale, uh, a little more spherical than the eight burst. Very much so. And it, it uh, is probably not a spherical nebula, but uh, it does appear so on, on, on our bit. sky. And I think the color in the in, in a photograph is much more pronounced than it is in the in the eyepiece. It, most people would describe the, the owl as being nebular gray, just sort of uh, rather faint and diffuse looking, um, and evenly illuminated in smaller scopes. The the um, unusual uh, distribution of the of, of the illumination gets more apparent as you get to larger and larger apertures. Mm -hmm. Quite an easy find and a, and a great, uh, great planetary to check off. 
cloth. So IC 3568, I think, is our only uh, IC object on the, on the list. And um, this is known as the Lemon Slice Nebula, among other uh, nicknames. Okay. But it, uh, the, I think it was uh, James Caller who uh, tagged it Lemon Slice, because if you look at the uh, Hubble photograph, you can see a, uh, an inner structure, very elaborate, um, uh, almost spiderweb structure that, that very much looks like, the, uh, like a, a slice of lemon. Uh, I don't remember. Shows that. Hmm. No, no, no not, not really. Mm. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, okay. Yes. So that, that picture you're showing there is not the lemon slice. That's 2818. Uh, where am I at here? Yeah, so, yeah, you're. Uh, I'm off by one? Yeah. No. We have a photo. No, 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 no. I don't think we do. Right. Uh, maybe we don't have an image of this one. No, I don't think we do. That's not, uh, we did not show sure. one. Okay. Well, drafts, I wanted to see a lemon slice. Oh, well. Yeah. Um, anyone that does a, uh, a, a search, you know, a, a internet search on it will find the, the Hubble photograph that uh, very much looks like a lemon slice. So you can see where it got, got its numb. I'm gonna put a I'm gonna put a link to that in the video down once we're done here. I'll put that up yeah, cool. video description. <clears throat> I got so, so that's another object that you know uh, being high in the sky, it's uh, it's available most of the year, but it's it's pretty well placed in the in the spring sky, and that's why we included it uh, in this one. And it's it's visible in, in rather small apertures. And again, you know, the larger you go, the more you're going to see. And it uh, responds well to filters. So it's a good, good object for that as well. But that next object where you did show a picture is, is kind of interesting. It has an interesting history, too, in that uh, NGC 2818 refers to both a, an open cluster and this planetary nebula. Mm. The, um, Depending on your reference and what catalog you look at, uh, one or the other might be labeled 2818A, but initially uh, it was considered to be part of the open cluster. So um, we th they thought that this was just a, a nebulous patch within a, an open cluster. And for a long time, it was considered the best example of a planetary nebula associated with an open cluster. Okay. But unfortunately, now, recently, uh, there's been uh, radio velocity measurements that show that the planetary is actually a foreground object. Okay. So it's in front of the, the uh, open cluster. Okay. Very similar to M46, and it's uh, what looks like an embedded planetary that's not. Mm -hmm. And they are unassociated. There's at different distances. But as you can see from the photograph, it's a rather interesting um, yeah. object. And uh, again, um, you, you don't see the structure that is apparent in this photograph. It looks more spherical through the eyepiece, but employ uh, filters and larger aperture and study an object long enough, uh, you can see some structure in this object. Of course, uh, being down where it is, it's hard for a lot of us at mid-northern latitudes to uh, get a good look at it. So you've mentioned filters a couple of times here. We got this little little gray box. Uh, you want to talk about filters a little bit? Sure. So um, most planetary or most nebula uh, observers will be familiar with these uh, various filters. And, uh, I have to smile a little bit with this uh, sidebar box because um, it's not exactly the way I would have uh, presented the, uh, the, the, the filters. Um, we had a little bit of uh, editing going on here as to, as to what we call them, but they, really there's no uh, 
functional difference in, in what's going on here. But the popular filters for uh, using uh, or observing planetary nebula, probably the most useful is something called the ultra high contrast filter okay. or UHC. Now that term is um, kind of widely used through the industry. But when I say a UHC, I'm, I'm referring to sort of a narrow band version of, of a uh, filter um, produced by Lumicon. And uh, I think Orion has one, there's, there's a few. Some manufacturers use the term UHC or ultra high contrast for their light pollution filters. And, and that's pretty much what this sidebar is, is talking about. Okay. But uh, the other uh, really valuable filter is the O3 or oxygen three filter. Mm -hmm. and that refers to um, doubly ionized oxygen. That's yep. what O3 refers to. And mm -hmm. uh, it basically filters out almost everything except a narrow band around um, around 500 nanometers on the visible scale. Mm -hmm. So that is the uh, principal wavelength that, that planetaries uh, emit their light in. And so by reducing all other wavelengths, we can sort of enhance the, uh, the visibility of the nebula. So we, we improve its uh, contrast by kind of knocking off all the light except for that principal wavelength in the middle of that band. And so that can help bring it out. The problem is that in, in an O3 filter in particular, it, it does filter out a great deal of the spectrum. So it darkens the image. And so it might be less useful for smaller telescopes than it is in a larger telescope. Opinions vary on that. But, um, I don't believe that. I, I, I tend to feel that the UHC is, it, it passes most of the, the wavelengths we want and filters out most of the light pollution filters or wavelengths. And so um, it also lets enough light in to, to have a pleasing view and I think it's the most useful filter overall. Cool. Of course, some of these planetaries actually need that O3 filter but to enhance them yeah. mm -hmm. at their best. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So I think the next one up is uh, J900, John Care 900. Um, and this was uh, kind of discovered by a double star uh, um, survey and initially cataloged as a double star and was discovered as a double star. And it, uh, it does, to some people, still appear a little bit like a double star in the telescope. Mm -hmm. It takes a, a little bit of work to uh, pull out the sort of spherical disk of J900. Um, Easily seen once you once you've once you've seen it the first time, it gets better. Make note. Yeah, J nine hundred. Okay. So we like we like this next one. This NGC forty three sixty one is is down in uh, Corvus, and it's kind of uh, easy to find because it's well located inside that uh, sort of lopsided trapezoid. It, that forms the body of Corvus the Crow. Mm -hmm. And uh, the interesting thing about 4361, you can see that sort of um, in, the, in the photograph, you see what they call like a lawn sprinkler uh, structure. It looks like uh, opposing jets of water from a, from a rotating sprinkler, but you're not gonna see that in the eyepiece to any, any degree where you can pick that out. But another interesting thing about it is that um, we actually think that this object is, rather than being bipolar, it's also, is actually quadrupolar. There's, there's um, uh, four lobes rather than the general two that we see in a lot of non-spherical planetaries. Mm -hmm. And it might be actually two uh, co-evolving stars that are approximately at the same point in their evolution actually uh, creating two kind of superimposed planetary nebulae on, on top of each other. 
Oh, well. <laughs> that's pretty cool. I, love I, mean, that. I think that's, I love uh, that. that's fantastic. Okay. <laughs> oh, but of course, that's not going to be apparent in the eye, unfortunately. Yeah. But uh, it is uh, easily reachable by most people in the Continental 48 and uh, a very bright and easily seen object. That is awesome. Yeah, it looks like this picture was taken by Adam Block, uh, who we did yeah. a telescope or a, uh, a YouTube video on just uh, a few weeks ago. So you can right. listen to Adam talk about his astrophotography. Yeah, I, I believe Adam spent quite a long time in Kitt Peak. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. He yeah. did. Hmm. Okay. So we got down in Hydra is an object, um, NGC 2610. Okay. And I think we have a picture of it there. Uh, okay. Which are we talking about, 2610? Yeah. That one's a different one. Maybe, maybe we don't have a picture. Next one in the article anyway is, uh, I don't know, 2610. Maybe this is another one where we don't have uh, yeah, I don't think we, I don't think we, uh, there's a, yeah, there's not an image on 26. Um, there is on the J and the R one though. So, okay. NGC 2610. Yeah. So um, it is sort of a faint disc, but a, a filter really brings this guy out. So this is one of those objects that uh, you can really see the benefit of popping a filter in the eyepiece or even in front of your eye. I mean, some people just use a filter by, putting it between their fingers and, you know, moving it in between your eye and the eyepiece so that you can sort of blink back and forth. But uh, I, I like using it in a filter wheel so that I can, you know, put the filter in without actually taking the eyepiece out and screwing something into the eyepiece. But, uh, an interesting thing about 2610 that uh, you'll find in the literature is that uh, it's, it's got, um, it, it's been very important scientifically for, for utilizing these photoionization codes. Mm -hmm. the, the way we study the way that stars return material to the interstellar medium mm -hmm. uh, is by looking at these, these, uh, this, these photoionization uh, codes. And this particular object has been well studied because it's, it's a rather simple object. It doesn't have a lot of um, unusual structures to it. So it's, it's kind of a, a dream come true for a sort of a, a skyward observatory or a laboratory is the word I wanted to use. Right. So interesting in that respect, of course, again, you know, not, not anything apparent in that eyepiece. You know, you're going to see a, a, a nice disk. So if you look at the uh, the next object is is Jones Emerson one, uh -huh. and um, that was actually uh, discovered on a in a, on a uh, photographic plate and and cataloged as a pair of galaxies. Okay. So initially uh, it was listed as a pair of galaxies for quite some time until it was identified as a uh, as an actual planetary nebula. It's become uh, fairly well known now. And, Maybe because the, the name's unusual, there's not enough, a lot of objects with Jones Emerson uh, as a moniker, so uh, it's become kind of kind of well known among, among among amateurs, and it's fairly uh, easy to see. Um, you're not going to get the type of uh, headphone structure that you see in the picture mm -hmm. necessarily, but um, it did get that moniker. Because you can see, and it's very obvious in the picture, not so much in the in the eyepiece, but uh, you have to have a good imagination for some of these uh, some of these nicknames. Well, you still got me on the lemon one, lemon slice. I still I'm gonna yeah, that lemon slice is kind of neat. It does have other uh, other monikers, but some of them are kind of out of favor in today's climate. We'll say lemon. <laughs> yeah, we'll say lemon slice. But yeah, so, I can uh, see a pair of iPods on this one right here. <laughs> iPod headphones. Okay. So I should point out that um, I'm, I am the uh, coordinator for the Astronomical League's Planetary Nebula Program. Mm -hmm. 
And so um, that program consists of 110 objects. It was modeled after the Messier program, uh, 60 of which will get you a certificate ah. and 110 will get you a certificate and a pin, the cool. entire program. So all the objects that we've uh, mentioned so far are objects that are on that planetary nebula program. They're all part of that that program. So you've got a good start on the program if you go through this article and follow along and, and get of all, all of our objects. Cool. I want a pin. But the next three are considered to be alternates for that program, but they're not part of the basic program. And the reason is that these are tough and they were given to us here or, or added to the article to present a challenge. Got and it. they are very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. So that first one, Kohotek 2.2 in Monoceros is um, two, two. very uh, large and, and faint disk. So 2.2. Two. Yeah, 2-2, two two, K2.2, two, two, I'm sorry. Uh-huh, yeah, okay. Yeah, that the K stands for Kohotek. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, this was presented as a challenge. And difficult to see because it is so large. and. Um, and faint. Yeah, that's fine. And as I, uh, I think I just mentioned, it is an alternate object for um, northern observers on the planetary nebula program. What I did with that program is um, because the original objects were all visible from our club in Virginia that uh, was responsible for creating the program. So everything was uh, really based on what you could see from Virginia Beach, Virginia. So a lot of uh, our observers in northern latitudes and our Canadian friends have a really tough time with some of the more southerly objects. So we've added uh, about 40 alternates and just allow people to say, well, I can't get to this guy. He's too low. So I want to replace it with this. That's not always a good thing <laughs> because some of these are pretty tough. And K22 is one of those in that, in that category. Okay. Very cool, Monoceros. But that next one, is uh, even worse. Or PUW1 um, is extremely large and very, very um, faint. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, yes. Yeah, I don't think we have a uh, single the area. We just have a uh, let's map see. of it. Uh, yeah, we just have a map of this one. We don't get the map yeah. until. So, but you will see. Um, yeah, so. Do we have it on that map? Uh, it's not on that. No, because there's low TR5. So I don't think we have a map or an image. Plus, I'm missing yeah. something of PUWE1. Well, the good news is that it's available to uh, most of us all year, being uh, you know high in the sky up in links. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, it is a little bit difficult to uh, to pick it out. Oh, yeah. It looks like you even had some trouble with your thirty-inch dub. Yeah. So as I mentioned there, um, what's what I generally do with a really large, low surface brightness object like this is to, um, to point at a portion of the sky away from the object, okay. get your eye adjusted to the blackness of the background sky, slowly kind of scan towards the center of the object. Okay. And if you do that back and forth a few times, you should typically be able to detect just that subtle change in brightness. Uh -huh. Not much to write home about, but um, it is a, you know, quite a uh, coup if you're able to get a hold of it. I think there's only been a few legitimate sightings of this object. Uh, so it's, I have a friend back east that's fond of telling me, you can't get a ticket for trying. <laughs> and so, you know, that's the philosophy here. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's right. an incredibly uh, difficult observation, but it's, you can't get a ticket and why not try it and see if you, know, you can get in that small 
group of uh, observers that have uh, been successful with this guy. Cool. Another one to put a link in. <laughs> and then finally, we got LOTR5, L-O-T-R. Before we move on from PUWE1, I, I would like to mention that there is an error in the article. Oh, no. Um, we actually say that this in angular size is actually the largest planetary nebula. And of course that should have said one of the largest planetary nebula. There will be a uh, for the record cor correction coming out on a future issue. So uh, we didn't mean to say it is definitively the largest object in the, in the, uh, in the largest planetary known. It's, it should have said one of the largest. It's up there and it's definitely in contention, but uh, there are others that might, uh, you know, be, uh, uh -huh. you know, claiming that type. And the last object here, the uh, LOTR5 is another toughie. Um, this one I have seen. And Jay McNeil supposedly was the uh, first known report you know, within the planetary nebula community. Um, and I got that information from Kent Wallace, who is a pretty well-known planetary nebula observer and author. Uh -huh. uh, and Kent, informs us that, um, that probably Jay McNeil was the first person to write about this or mention um, to anyone that he's uh, that he, he got that at the Texas Star Party. But um, this is also uh, looks like a uh, sort of a double star with a very bright central, I'm sorry, not a double star, but a very bright central star. Oh, wow. Look the the uh, the central star really overwhelms the nebula. That's probably why it's as difficult as it is. Yeah. The uh, this picture really exaggerates the visibility of the nebula. The nebula is is, is quite faint and quite difficult to uh, define. But using a photograph like this, you should be able to define the, the limits of the object and and kind of use that scanning across the boundary, uh, you know, process to kind of pick it out use it mm -hmm. this is a foreground star or that is uh, that should be the plant the the uh the central star it's it's a it's a variable so it does get bright at times it's um like those lately but that's probably an overexposed view of that well, you get that central star yeah it's yeah. but but the central star is bright enough to overwhelm that nebula that's it is probably what makes it so very very difficult Okay. Very nice. So you mentioned earlier to me that um, you know what's next as far as uh, planetary nebulae, and I uh, we're still working on the uh, the articles for next year. Uh, one of them that might be in the hopper is a, a future article on um, probably the uh, objects of maybe Sagittarius or, or Scorpius coming okay. along. Cool. But I, I have had uh, six other articles or five other articles on planetary nebula. So we have we have talked about uh, winter planetaries and we've been, done a few summer planetaries and and um, our Aquila Gems article kind of covered the uh, a lot of the fall area, you know, the fall sky. So uh -huh. I think we went over a little bit, but um, oh, it's all good. sorry to be uh, we're so talking far. about we're talking about great objects, so. Um, they really are. They're fascinating objects. And, uh, you know, it's such a big and wide genre of objects that uh, it's almost hard to imagine that those small, tiny stellar points and those giant, you know, low surface brightness monsters are the same ob same type of object. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I do have some, uh, I do have some research interest on those central objects. So it's great. Very cool. Ted, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us today and walking us through your super lovely Blossoms article for March 2020. Well, thank you for having me. It was right. fun. It was fun. I learned something. I learned several things, actually. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on the next one. Learn about the lemon slice, anyway. Yeah, for okay. one. Thank you. <laughs>